Okay, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Uh, Assalamu alaikum uh, to everyone. Uh, first of all, before starting my lecture, I uh, want to actually say Alhamdulillah for uh, uh, having this uh, actually honor to be awarded the IDB prize. I thank the IDB prize committee for honoring me this uh, prestigious award. I'm really uh, indeed honored and humbled. Uh, I just want to say a few words before I st uh, start my lecture. I also want to thank IRTI actually for another reason. Uh, it is at IRTI that I learned my Islamic economics and finance. Uh, I was very fortunate to be in company of many pioneering Islamic economists while I was in IRTI in Jeddah. And not only IRTI actually, uh, in, at King Abdulaziz University also, there was, mashallah, a lot of uh, very well-known economists. So I, am, I owe my thanks and gratitude, gratitude to, to uh, them uh, from whom I've actually learned uh, Islamic economics and finance. They were my teachers and I actually stand on their shoulders uh, of these giants. I just want to take this opportunity to remember Dr. Nijatullah Siddiqui who passed away last month. Uh, who was also one of my teachers and mentors, I would say. Uh, and before I start, I also want to congratulate my fellow uh, prize winners, Professor Mansur Masi and Professor Tarikullah Khan for receiving the IDB prize. Uh, my topic is Islamic capital, uh, ethical foundations of uh, an equitable economic system. Uh, I Actually, I wrote a paper uh, which is more than 40 pages. So there's a lot of things in the paper, but since I have only half an hour, I'll try to cover the key things and some things as you uh, can see, uh, given the large amount of content, I'll have to go very fast. So it basically has two key uh, components. The first three parts are provide the foundations of the, uh, in some ways foundation and context of the discussions of the second part, which is the main contribution of the paper. Uh, so in, uh, I'll just basically following the paper content uh, in outlining uh, this uh, agenda for today. Now we uh, know that SDGs were launched in 2015 as a plan of action for people, planet and prosperity. When it comes to people, the key issues relate to poverty and inequalities. Uh, planet, of course, relates to sustainable development, and prosperity is economic growth and development that includes people and planet. So my focus is actually on people, looking mainly at inequalities, income inequalities and poverty. And I think Dr. Tariq Khan will be talking about uh, the planet-related issues in terms of sustainable environment. Now, one of the key issues uh, when it comes to uh, poverty and inequalities is that uh, even with the massive uh, uh, and immense growth of wealth, uh, the, it seems that societies cannot uh, resolve the problem of inequality. Uh, just to give you an example, during the COVID time, the wealth of billionaires grew by 4.4 trillion US dollars, uh, whereas uh, 100 million additional people fell uh, into poverty line. So one of the things uh, in which we can understand poverty and inequalities is to look at the capitalist system and inherent structures which create uh, the inequalities. And when we talk about the capitalist systems, uh, we have to actually understand the nature of capital. Capital forms the starting point as well as the finishing point of that system. Actually, this is a quote by Marx, uh, who, as you know, have written a lot on uh, capitalism. Now, uh, given these weaknesses in capitalism, uh, that it creates inequalities, uh, Islamic economists, they had launched the uh, Islamic economics uh, uh, in the 1970s, uh, formally through uh, the conference in Mecca, uh, that, uh, and they argued that an economic system based on Islamic legal principles and ethical values would resolve the trade off between the growth and inequality. And they highlighted that the legal principles, for example, among others, prohibition of riba, gharar, uh, haram sectors, and implementation of zatka, these are the key, uh, basically, um, uh, legal framework of the system. Uh, 
And on top of it, of course, there would be ethical values, among others, <clears throat> the ethical behavior of individuals as captured in Homo Islamicus, and also, more importantly, the Makasa the Sharia, <clears throat> which will provide the ethical foundations. And this will uh, lead to uh, an economy which would be uh, basically producing equitable growth. Now, of course, uh, when it comes to implementation of uh, an Islamic economy, we see that it is, has been narrow and marginal. It has been focused mainly in the Islamic finance uh, sector. Uh, and there are, of course, uh, applications of zakat to some extent uh, in some countries. Uh, and uh, we also would expect that uh, Muslims would have some uh, behavioral characteristics, ethical uh, characteristics as envisaged in Homo Islamicus. Now, the issue is, uh, uh, if you look at, uh, as I said, the key uh, topic or theme of my talk is on income inequalities uh, and growth. So if you look at the, uh, the um, income and wealth concentration, uh, this is the latest figure from 2020, I think, uh, for different regions. The interesting thing, which I was actually in some way surprised, was the MENA region has, as you see, one of the worst wealth uh, income and wealth uh, uh, distribution. Actually, when it comes to income uh, distribution, the top 10% uh, top share of uh, income is the highest for MENA, which means that the income distribution in MENA is uh, the worst. Now, the question would arise, why is the inequality worse in MENA region? even with the remnants of Islamic ex, uh, economic practices. And when I say remnants, uh, most likely most of the MENA region, they would practice zakat to some extent, they would have Islamic finance, and we will expect some, uh, uh, a lot of people would have elements of Islamic uh, ethics in, in their uh, economic uh, transactions and behaviors. So uh, we need to understand this. Now, if you look at uh, uh, capitalism, even though it's established system, there are so many uh, books and papers and uh, research going on on Islamic, uh, sorry, on capitalism itself. And here is a sample of a few. Uh, and actually, as I said, these are few, but there are a lot others, which are, so there is a lot of work being going on still now to understand how capitalism works and things like that. But when it comes to Islamic uh, economic system, we don't see much contribution. The focus of the research is on Islamic finance mainly. Uh, and um, uh, initially the pioneers, they used to talk about the Islamic economic system. So what I plan to do is, in the, actually what I did in this paper was to actually go back and revisit uh, the notion of capital, which forms the heart of the uh, contemporary economic systems and try to look at it from uh, an Islamic perspective and try to understand why uh, even in Muslim countries, we have uh, a lot of inequality, uh, uh, even though we <clears throat> claim that uh, the uh, economic system should produce uh, 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 equal distribution of income and wealth. So in the paper, I basically examine the attributes of capital as a factor of production in contemporary economies, identify the key uh, legal and ethical principles of Sharia, and develop a framework of Islamic capital to assess implications for growth and equity, explore the role of Islamic finance capital in affecting growth and equity, and then suggest ways uh, in which Islamic capital can produce equitable growth. As for the first part, introduction and those things to capital and Islamic uh, uh, legal systems, I will go very fast. I'll try to focus more on the contribution of the paper. As uh, all of you are aware, capitalism is linked to the new, new liberal uh, uh, economic thinking, and it is actually <clears throat> linked to the Enlightenment area, which one of the issues about the so-called Enlightenment area in Europe was that uh, they started looking at everything in positive terms. Ethics was ignored. Uh, religion was taken away from uh, life and actually uh, from the state and uh, it, it, it became a very personal thing. But the key thing about uh, capitalism is that capital is the dominant factor of production. And actually uh, it uh, has, uh, it, it, one of the features is that 
it owns the uh, production process and uh, and controls it. So capital becomes a very key uh, issue in understanding growth and inequalities. Now, again, uh, in, in the paper, I have gone over uh, the extensive literature, uh, but if you look at uh, <clears throat> the notions of capital, we can think of it in two different ways. One is the evolution of the form of capital. Initially, when we thought about capital, it used to be physical capital in terms of machines, equipments, and other things. Uh, then it transformed into financial capital uh, and that forms of uh, key forms of financial capital was equity and debt. And then of course uh, we have now the under the fourth industrial revolution, the information capital, which is the data, digital codes, algorithms, which actually form uh, the new forms of capital. But what is important for uh, to look in terms of uh, growth and inequality is to look at capital in terms of productive and fictitious. And actually this productive capital and fictitious capital, again, uh, it was uh, highlighted by Marx in his uh, discussions. Uh, and uh, he basically said productive capital is the risk capital that is used in production and it earns profit. So the return of uh, uh, productive capital is profit. It is the residual which uh, arises uh, in a production process. In terms of fictitious uh, capital, uh, it is basically the debt capital uh, whose return is not directly linked to production. So uh, again, the fictitious capital, there are different variations of it. One extreme variation is even if debt is used in production, it is fictitious uh, because the return on debt is not dependent on the profitability of a company. Uh, so when we're talking about fictitious capital, of course, if you extend it to households and financial sectors, because nowadays a lot of uh, financing actually goes to the household and the financial sector itself. So all of this would be fictitious because it is not contributing uh, to the uh, productive sector. And because fictitious capital is not linked to production, it can actually grow without limits. And that's uh, the concept of financialization where we see that the financial sector is exploding uh, and is much, much uh, larger than the real sector. Uh, now, of course, for us, from an Islamic finance and Islamic uh, economic system perspective, we are interested in the legal and ethical structures of capital. Uh, again, if we look at the discussions on the legal uh, uh, perspectives of capitalism, uh, again, Max Weber, among others, uh, he identified that uh, that capitalist system is successful because uh, the law is uh, rational law is used. It is viewed in a positive way. So you have to, uh, uh, in some ways, uh, leave the normative aspects and look at the legal system in a very positive way. Now, another a very interesting contribution uh, by a scholar from Columbia University, Katrina Pistor, uh, the Code of Capital. Uh, she actually says that the uh, capital is legally constructed and uh, laws, contract law, bankruptcy law, uh, the corporation law, collateral law, these are used to, in some ways, uh, codify capital. So you can have an asset, but the asset is not capital unless you actually, it has certain attributes and features. And she identifies four features which actually makes capital uh, or which makes an asset or converts an asset into a capital. And these are priority. When you talk about priority, it is about uh, ranking claims and rights over assets of a debtor. So it's basically when there's bankruptcy, who gets what, uh, that priority is determined through the contracts and the law, uh, the durability of asset, which is basically the life, lifespan of asset uh, extending over periods of time. Universality is another feature and attribute of capital, which is that uh, these priority claims are applicable across space. So durability is uh, across time and universality is up across space. And the other feature and the main feature is uh, convertibility, which basically means you can convert capital into cash uh, when there is, so it basically the liquidity feature of uh, capital. Now, when it comes to ethical uh, perspectives, so the, uh, the focus is on procedural justice, the rule of law. As I said, they look at it in a very positive perspective. So uh, uh, the ethics of uh, a capitalist, capitalist system is the rule of law. When it comes to commutative justice, which is basically 
justice in contracts, uh, which can be defined as uh, equality of counter values and also distributive justice. These are not discussed too much in, uh, in this system. So in conclusion, when we look at capitalism growth and inequality, we see that uh, capitalism is basically profit-driven production processes. And because it's pro uh, uh, production, the, there is incentive to make profit, uh, it increases efficiency and actually it can produce growth. So capitalism has been successful in producing growth as we see the amount of wealth which has been created. But of course it comes at the cost of inequalities. And what are the explanations of this in the capitalist system? Exploitation of labor by capital owners by extracting labor surplus. This is the traditional Marxian perspective. Uh, then we have uh, Thomas Piketty coming up with uh, his empirical study, which shows that capitalism inherently creates in inequality because return of capital R is always greater than the GDP growth rate. And this actually uh, produces inequality because uh, capital owners, they extract more uh, of the growth than the rest of the, uh, the uh, uh, economy. And then, of course, the other reason for uh, uh, increase in inequality is the increase in fictitious capital. Here, in, as I mentioned, fictitious capital, you are earning a return which is not dependent on the, the economy. So even if, when the economy is uh, in a recession, uh, everybody is making a loss. Uh, if you are owning fictitious capital in terms of debt, you still uh, are earning a positive profit. So the financial sector basically appropriates resources from the household and business sectors uh, through fictitious capital. And the final point is financial exclusion and the poverty premium. Poverty premium is that the poor people uh, pay much higher prices uh, for their products compared to the relatively well off. So most of the uh, poor are not do not have a financial access but those who have, they are paying more. So both of these actually create uh, more inequalities. Now let's move on to the second part of the uh, discussion, which is basically the Islamic perspectives on capital. Uh, before I go to uh, define capital uh, from an Islamic perspective, uh, we just look at some basic principles, the legal perspectives, basically uh, the, it's a prohibition uh, driven perspective that all activities are permitted except what is prohibited by Sharia. And uh, of course the prohibitions can be broadly classified at riba and gharan. And of course there are some prohibited sectors, for example, uh, pork and gambling and alcohol, uh, which are uh, obvious. But when it comes to ethics, uh, we can uh, basically, I think, uh, again, this is what is the focus of this paper. Uh, it, is about what we call teleological ethics, that uh, what is the impact of uh, the activities. Uh, and this I think is summarized in the maxim of Maslah and Mafsada. Actually, some Sharia scholars say that if you want to summarize Sharia in one sentence, it would be that Sharia is there to enhance uh, welfare or Maslaha and minimize harm. Now, the essentials of, uh, of course, uh, Maslaha are reflected in Makasid Sharia. Uh, now, before I go to Makassar the Sharia, of course, there are ethics uh, related to human behavior. Uh, we are talking about uh, the homo Islamicus, which has been discussed by Islamic economists. And when it comes to Makassar, of course, there's the general Makassar, the protection of faith, self, intellect, posterity, wealth, and, and dignity. Uh, but I think what is important uh, for uh, economics is um, the Makassar related to economic transactions. And this uh, Ibn Ashur has identified uh, the Makassid related to economic transactions as again five. And these are basically protection and enhancement of marketability. Marketability is basically, I think, related to the liquidity, uh, buying and selling uh, of, uh, uh, of property, transparency, uh, preservation, durability, and justice. Now, interestingly, if you see these Makassid of uh, marketability, preservation, and durability, uh, these are similar to Pistor's uh, uh, features of uh, characteristics of, uh, uh, of uh, capital in, in, in the capitalist system. Now, the other, I think, uh, very important uh, uh, source of ethics uh, in uh, Islamic uh, uh, economics uh, comes from the legal maxims. Legal maxims or the Qaeda al-Fiqh, uh, they represent uh, the spirit and essence of Sharia uh, 
uh, and also covers the ethical principles. Now, if uh, we uh, uh, bring in this ethical perspective and combine it with the contemporary perspectives of uh, capital being legally constructed, so we will have an attributes on Islamic capital, which will be similar to conventional capital, which is actually durable, priority, durability, universality, and convertibility. As I said, durability, universality, and convertibility are also reflected in the uh, Ibn Ashur's uh, five maqasid. On top of it, we add two more uh, conditions. One relates to transparency, and I'm calling this as informational ethics, and the other is uh, justice. So when we're looking at capital from Islamic perspective, both legal and also the ethical, we have to bring in the maqasid related issues and uh, add transparency or the informational ethics. And of course, justice, uh, a hallmark of uh, Islamic uh, transactions. Now, uh, we know justice is actually the underlying principle which governs uh, economic transactions in, uh, in uh, uh, Surah Bakara, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has declared war on uh, people who are dealing with interest, uh, he, I mean, this, uh, the verse ends with, do not, uh, uh, deal not unjustly, and you shall not be dealt with unjustly. La, la tazlimuna wa la tuzlamun. So this is, I think, the key sense that uh, justice is the underlying feature uh, which should govern, uh, uh, underlying ethical feature which should govern economic transactions. Now, I think we can think of two kinds of justice when it comes to uh, uh, transactions. One is what we call commutative justice. And this is basically the equality of counter values in exchange, uh, or to put it differently, exchange at just or fair prices. And actually, if you look at the prohibitions of riba, uh, they are prohibited because uh, there is not uh, inequality in the counter values. So this is a very important feature uh, justice feature in economic transactions. And the other thing is, of course, distributive justice. And uh, again, in literature, there's a very interesting discussion that when you're talking about distributive justice, we usually talk in terms of distribution of income and wealth, but uh, there is an issue about distribution of risk also, right? So the benefits and the costs both have to be considered together. And uh, as, you, as uh, we are all aware, we have actually these two uh, legal maxims, uh, al-kharaj with the man and al-hun with al-hun, which basically links the uh, uh, risks to returns or returns to risk actually. So I think uh, the underlying uh, distributive justice in contracts should be reflected by uh, these maxims, which uh, links the returns to risks. Now, given this background uh, in the paper, I distinguish uh, between productive and uh, fictitious um, uh, capital from Islamic point of view. But I further uh, classify productive into productive and quasi-productive. Uh, productive is the pure risk capital, the equity, uh, which is used in business. The, the uh, owners of this capital, they take the risk and they earn a business profit, which is the residual of the production process. Quasi-productive is also used in business sector. Uh, but these are uh, asset-based or debt-based. Uh, asset, of course, earns a return. So it is not the returns of an asset is not directly li linked to the, uh, the productivity of the business. So that's why it is quasi-productive. Actually, uh, fr from uh, if you take the uh, Marxian perspective, they will consider this to be a, a fictitious capital. But I have put them uh, as quasi-productive because they're still used in production. And these are the sources of income or return, rent from asset-based and trading profit. If it's a murabaha and tawarruk, it's a fictitious trading profit. And then we have a quasi-fictitious, which is basically a household sector uh, where asset and equity-based modes of financing are used. Here, I'm calling it quasi-fictitious, even though it's not used in production, because if it's a real asset, uh, there's an implicit rent which this real asset is generating. So that's why it's quasi-fictitious. But if the financing to the household sector and the financial sector takes the form of debt uh, in terms of murabaha, for example, or in terms of uh, tawarruk, then we are having a, a case where it, it is basically fictitious capital. 
now uh, in given this background i actually uh, uh, define uh, or i have some propositions or you can say axioms which uh, basically uh, underlies the key features uh, in in, in uh, an economy so there are two propositions related to capital and growth uh, the first proposition is that growth depends on distribution of productive and fictitious capital of course it's obvious if uh, more capital is used in uh, the productive sector in the business sector you will get more growth if it is given to household sector and uh, financial sector it does not produce any growth uh, because it's not productive sectors anyway and then you have uh, the second one growth is below potential due to non-availability of capital uh, this is basically about financial exclusion here uh, the a uh, lot of the micro and small enterprises they cannot produce the uh, output they want to because they do not have access to capital. So this is in some ways an exclusion uh, argument uh, and, uh, in, and indirectly it affects the growth. The propositions which uh, link capital to equity, I have five. Uh, the first proposition is says the equality depends on the distribution of value within a firm. Now, of course, this is the traditional uh, Marxian uh, 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 argument that uh, the capital owners they extract surplus value from the labor so the whatever value is created within the production process as uh, a small part is given to labor and the most of it is taken by the capital owners so one way to deal with this is to have a more equitable uh, uh, distribution of uh, wages to the or just wages to the uh, workers the second proposition is inequality depends on distribution uh, of ownership and capital. Uh, I'm aware that I'm running out of time. The third is equality increases due to fictitious and debt capital. Uh, and then uh, inequality results from commutative injustice related to price of capital. So here, if the price is not just, uh, if it is exploitative prices, it will uh, uh, lead to exploitation sorry and the final one distributed just relates to risk uh, return distribution is important determinant of equality i think uh, as i said i'm aware of time what i do in the paper is then i look at what islamic finance is doing uh, for example i look at the islamic capital productive versus fictitious capital this is data taken from 10 countries from ifsb uh, the summary uh, shows that the productive capital uh, by Islamic banks given to the uh, manufacturing and construction sector was only 15%, whereas uh, fictitious, fictitious capital given to the household sectors was 48%. So the conclusion is contribution of Islamic banks towards growth is minimal. Financing the household sector implies extracting returns from household without adding anything to production. So again, uh, as you see, the uh, Islamic banking sector is not contributing much to growth. Uh, in terms of uh, financing more to the housing sector. Similarly, here we look at the types of uh, uh, financing. Again, I think we are all aware that most of the debt uh, uh, financing in Islamic banks is debt-based. And uh, the implication is that return on debt is not linked to the uh, real activities, so it creates actually inequality, especially when there's a negative shock, uh, the inequality is uh, increase if it is debt-based financing. Uh, now, the third one is that the commutative, uh, sorry, commutative justice and pricing of capital. Now, of course, we are also aware that Islamic finance products are uh, more expensive uh, than conventional products. And sometimes we, we uh, uh, say that if uh, the customers and the banks, they agree, it is fine. But there is an underlying uh, uh, problem with this because the implication is that Muslim customers they eventually and I put I have a hypothetical example if you have a house uh, home financing of uh, three hundred thousand US dollars and an Islamic bank is charging four percent versus a conventional bank charging one percent three percent over 30 years the Muslim client will pay 60,000 US dollars more than a conventional uh, 
Now, uh, of course, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the key thing here is the bank uh, is extracting value from the household sector, and this goes to the shareholders, mainly goes to the shareholders, which in some ways is uh, creating more inequality. Uh, finally, we have the financial exclusion. And again, uh, we see that uh, Islamic uh, financial sector, uh, when it comes to uh, serving the micro and small enterprises, their contribution is relatively small. Uh, the implication is the growth is less than poor potential and there's persistence of poverty due to lack, lack of productive capital. Uh, the final conclusion of this uh, section is that uh, when it comes to Islamic finance and growth, the evidence is mixed. Actually, a lot of uh, evidence shows positive correlation, and I'm talking about correlation, but there's weak evidence of causality. So whether when the GDP grows, the Islamic financial sector grows, we don't know what is the direction of the, uh, the uh, causality. Uh, in terms of Islamic finance and inequality, actually, uh, I just found one paper, and this is uh, Hillman's uh, paper with uh, another author. Uh, it came as a chapter in a book, and they find actually Islamic finance increases inequality. Uh, so that is a very interesting observation. Now, I will, uh, I'm aware that I'm over time, so I'll just quickly go over the last part of the, <clears throat> the paper, which basically the way forward. I'll just read these, uh, 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 these uh, in some policies which would improve inequality uh, in an economy uh, when we're looking at it from an Islamic capital perspective. Uh, so there are actually a lot of suggestions. So I'll just focus on the capital formation and types and I'll conclude. But the paper has some other, uh, uh, other uh, suggestions also. So there are seven, uh, uh, in some of suggestions which comes out of the paper. First is that establish a supporting legal e ecosystem to enable capitalization of assets. Now, of course, when you talk about Islamic finance, the legal system has support, has to support the Islamic finance transactions. So that is very important because uh, capital and finance are legally constructed. Second is enhance capital formation in micro and small enterprises. Uh, this relates to financial inclusion. Uh, introduce commutative justice in uh, contracts, uh, pay just wages uh, in the production process and remove poverty and piety premium. The piety premium is the religious premium which Muslims pay because they're using Islamic finance. And uh, introduce uh, distribute justice in contracts which basically means to implement uh, the maxims of returns uh, to risks, uh, which unfortunately is not being even uh, applied in um, uh, equity-based, mudara by musharaka based uh, financing. Increase the share of productive capital and decrease financialization. This is obvious uh, that uh, more capital has to go to the productive sector, less to household and financial sectors, uh, which implies that there has to be less financialization. Increase the proportion of not debt financing, non-debt financing, because debt financing creates uh, inequalities and increase the distribution of productive capital. Uh, so by increasing the number of capital owners here, this is actually a, a supply side issue in terms of the, we have to create opportunities for the low income and middle income country, uh, or sorry, middle income uh, households so that they can be owners of capital. And this basically relates to asset management and wealth management related issues. Now I'll just go to the last slide. Uh, going back to the SDGs was a plan for Planet, people, planet, and prosperity. The people issues, poverty, and uh, inequality has been persistent. And it seems it's very difficult to deal with it under the capitalist system. Part of the problem is structural, as uh, we have seen. Uh, and we saw that the evidence from Islamic capital finance practice is not encouraging. And I'll just read the last two sentences from the paper. The key message of the paper is that without introducing the ethics and notions of justice, Islamic economic and financial systems will not be able to tackle the problem of inequality. Beyond legal compliance, there is a need to embed ethics of transparency, fairness, and justice to tame the harmful effects of capital in order to produce economies that are equitable and promote balanced growth. 
Thank you very much.